This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He works with some of Hollywood's most star-studded events. Joe Lewis on this edition of Conversations. From the red carpets of Hollywood to major sporting events, it's Joe Lewis's job to enhance the experience of significant American entertainment spectacles. The Joe Lewis Company is in the business of creating, designing, staging, and implementing big-time events. After a stint with Sony Pictures, Joe set out to run his own show. Since becoming an entrepreneur, he has worked with some of the marquee brands in the entertainment industry. Names like MTV, American Idol, Nickelodeon, and the Academy Awards. Joe's talents have proven valuable in his hometown as well. Under the moniker Bonfire Jam, he has organized and promoted several big concerts in Northwest Florida. We welcome Joe Lewis to Conversations. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here finally. Good deal. It finally worked out. Absolutely. Glad to get you in. Tell me exactly what your company does. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> you, you summed it up. <laughs> that's, events, yeah, huh? that's exactly what we do. We are, you know, we're not a, uh, we're not a special events company. We don't do weddings. We don't do uh, special. We don't do birthday parties. Yeah. We do big time sports and music and entertainment events. I mean, we've, we've kind of fell into it, you know, from my background at Sony, but you know, we're fortunate to do most of our events uh, started out in the televised world. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we just kind of broke out into sports and music. And now we've we've got our hands in pretty much anything that's branded news or media. Right. We're, we're, we're involved with it uh, in some capacity. So that's not a bad position to be in. Absolutely not. Yeah. So when folks see, I know some of the events like the, the red carpet events for MTV mm -hmm. or country music television mm -hmm. or something like that, sure. that's, that's kind we of We do. Good. We do. We still do a number of MTV events. I mean, a lot of people may or may not know MTV is the umbrella for Spike, Nickelodeon, CMT, all those other networks. So they all fall under the MTV umbrella. So we do tons of MTV projects, right. uh, including CMT and, and so on and so forth. So, but we don't do the same thing for all of them. Right. I mean, you know, we, we're unique in that we, not only will we produce, but we will design, we will take a project from concept ideation all the way through final billing. We build all of our own scenery. So we're unique in that we kind of have our hands in all uh, departments, if you will, of a broadcast production or non-broadcast production. Take me back. How did you get into this field? <laughs> How did I get into this field? Well, um, after graduating from Southern Miss, I got in, was in the restaurant business. Uh -huh. It was a natural progression for me, waiting tables and bartending all through high school and college. I was in the restaurant business. They moved me to South Florida. I was in South Florida and the Cheesecake Factory came along. Uh -huh and said, I'm taking you way back now. Uh -huh. Cheesecake Factory came along and said, you know, we're gonna double your salary and move you to Southern California. I was like, well, I'm 24, no <laughs> liabilities, no reason to stay here. Loaded up the truck <laughs> and, and moved, moved west <laughs> and moved to Beverly, literally <laughs> yeah. moved to Beverly yeah. and landed in Manhattan Beach. I worked wow. at one of the first four units for Cheesecake Factory there in Manhattan Beach and after about nine months, of corporate America and 90 hours a week, I was like, whoa, what's going on here? I'm in Southern California, right. I'm making good money, I'm living on the beach, why am I working 90 hours a week? This makes no sense. Right. Plus then I found out pretty quickly the corporate environment was not for me. Uh -huh. I've never been liked, I never liked being told what to do right. um, at any level, <laughs> and I always thought I could do it better. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I quickly learned that it wasn't a good match for either one of us, yeah. and I left. I left, I had money in the bank, I left and I said, you know what, I'm gonna get in the entertainment business. And I took a job at Sony Studios in the mail room okay. in 1994. And from there, I just kinda started networking, do what I do best. You know, a buddy of mine said one time, he goes, you know, Joe may not be the brightest guy in the room, but he's gonna know everybody in there and it's <laughs> gonna work for him. I got to that studio and it was, you know, it was, it was, it was open field. Yeah. I had access to every department from production to post-production to corporate to communications to editorial. I just started meeting people. When I'm delivering the mail, I'm talking to them and looking, seeing what they're doing. And I figured out pretty quickly that I didn't want to be stuck in a studio. I didn't want to be stuck behind a console. I wanted to be outside. Yeah. So I started giving my time 
to the production sound department at Sony, rolling cables, cleaning cables. I was a utility guy for free right. for two years. And then somebody picked me up to do a show. The truncated version is some guy said, hey, come work with us as a freelancer this weekend. I'm still in the mailroom. So I did. I became a utility in the business. And then I started on weekends saying, hey, I'm available. You guys want me? I got to where I was pretty good at it. Okay. And then came back to the studio, and Sony does a lot of events at the, at the studio. Premieres, mm -hmm. special events, all sorts of shows. Like a lot of these live shows, you know, at Sony, Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, all of these shows are on the lot there. Right. So all of these productions come in and do these events, rent their sound stages. Right. One day, I don't remember when it was, but Magic Johnson's Midsummer Night's Magic came to Sony, took over the entire studio. And then I was giving my time still to the production sound, and they needed help that weekend. Well, that weekend turned into be the catalyst and the thing that changed my entire life. So it was a nightmare. The show, it was a nightmare loading in. Catering was going in before the lights were going up top and audio was unorganized. It was a mess. Chaos. So me, it was chaos. So me being me, I went to the girls who ran the special events department, <laughs> said, if this happens again, will you please call me so I can organize this? Because this was a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Well, they called me. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> but I had enough sense to know, you know what? You've got to get the things up high done before you can do the things down low. Right. So I just started talking to all the departments and scheduling it. Next event that came in was MTV Movie Awards. And I was, I was the contact. I was the mailroom guy. But I was also doing this production sound stuff. Wow. So I was the contact. I was the liaise. It went off smooth as ever. And uh, MTV said, if you ever leave, we'll hire you as a freelance production manager. What's a production manager? <laughs> What's he do? <laughs> What's, <laughs> What's that guy do? He does exactly what you just did. And I'm like, oh. So I started digging in deeper. So I called him, said, I'm available. They started calling me. And then uh, six months to that day later, I left in 2000. So this was a six year, about five or six years. I don't really remember the exact time from the time I started at Sony to the time I left and I was a production manager. <laughs> you know, interesting on the mailroom story. <laughs> Let's, Definitely. let's think about how many folks who are at the top of Hollywood started out in the mailroom. Right. Barry Diller, mm -hmm. uh, I, Mike Ovitz, didn't he uh, start I believe Ovitz I did, believe. yep. I mean, some of the huge Hollywood powerhouses started there. So I, I think that's, that's... I'm right up there with them. <laughs> huge Hollywood powerhouse. <laughs> no, but my, my point good. is, I think that's a great lesson for young people to, to, to come in and, 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 you know, you don't necessarily have to start at the top of the ladder. That's right. Or expect to. In my opinion, learn. it's the only way to come in. Yeah. Because you know what? You can't manage and you can't coach and you can't educate people on how to do things if you haven't done it. Mm -hmm. And that's my honest opinion. Mm -hmm. I started at the very bottom mm -hmm. and I learned something every day and I pushed that forward. Yeah. And so you, you, in 2000, you decide, okay, I'm going out on my own. So actually, and, and, and you sort of started out as, as we rolled into 2001, 2002, a bit of a recession. What kind of challenges did you face there? I didn't face a challenge. I went to Europe for the millennium, for the ball drop. Okay. I said, you know what? <laughs> I've got money in the bank. I have nothing to worry about. There's no work. Goodbye. So yeah. I went to Europe for three months. <laughs> I came back. <laughs> I came back and put myself back in this position as a utility guy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then while I'm utility and I'm networking, talking, and um, I was sitting at coffee, and uh, I was sitting at coffee one day, downtown Manhattan Beach, which is where I live, talking on the phone to a client or something. And this girl sitting behind me said, hey, I overheard your conversation. What do you do? Well, I'm a production manager <laughs> in the entertainment business. <laughs> well, what do you mean? I, well, I do events. She goes, well, I overheard your conversation. You should call my boss. Sure, I'll call your boss. Who's your boss? This guy's Sean. So I called Sean the next day. Today, um, I can't remember her name, Adelaide or at whatever her name was, said she overheard you in a conversation. Um, tell me what you do. I said, well, I do events. I work with MTV. I had worked with them one time. Right, I worked right, with Magic right. Johnson. I worked with them one time. <laughs> I worked at Sony for five years. So yeah. it kind of got their attention. And he goes, we have this project, but you've got to leave in two weeks, and we need you to go do this project. Are you interested in production managing this thing called Rock and Jock? And this was MTV's rock star jock flag football game. I said, yeah, I'd love to go do it. Sure, where is it? It's at the Super Bowl. 
in New Orleans. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, I'll go. Let me think about it. Uh, yeah, I'm in. So here I am, fresh out of the mailroom, uh -huh. fresh out of Sony. I get this gig at Rock and Jock. Well, the reason I got it is because I had just worked with the MTV team that did it. Right. So it made a lot of sense. So I go to New Orleans, and I manage Rock and Jock, and I am the facilities guy for the NFL experience, which is the big multi-day festival for the Super Bowl. Right. Um, I did that. It went off perfect. Everything was went off grandly, and I got a lot of calls after that. So now I've got this resume, MTV. Never said how many times I did it. I just said I did it. You know, Magic Johnson, Sony, Super Bowl. So now I've opened up this whole new arena that I could work inside of. And I met everybody there. I went and shook their hand. I went and had a beer with them. I went and had gumbo with them. Let them know who I was. Right. And I came back, and it's been nonstop since then. So you've done everything, like you say, the, the experiences in the television. Talk a little bit about that. What's it like if you get a call to, to, to do something? Uh, I know you guys were involved, I guess, with, with CNN Heroes. We do CNN Heroes yeah. every year. We're actually prepping for it right now. What's that like? What's the process like? Well, the process all the way back to where they find me or the process of building the show? Well, well once they say, let's build a show, how do, you, how do you build a big show like that? Well, first, you've, you've got to define the creative. You find out what the creative is. They say, okay, Joe, this is the, f I'm not involved, well, it depends. Depends on what I'm involved with, if we're doing the pre-show stuff mm -hmm. or if we're doing the actual show. But first it starts with the creative and the format of what it's going to be about. Mm -hmm. And then once you get the creative, then you've got to, then you have to staff it with the people that are going to bring that creative to life. Right, right. Then you have to stage it, and then you've got to put the right people in place. Usually where we get involved, our company gets involved is once they've established that creative, they say, okay, we now want to wrap a pre-show red carpet and or concert special event into this. Most of them broadcast, some not. So then what we do is we take the show creative, mm -hmm. we take the format and we try to find inspiration from that show creative, because the experience on a lot of these shows really starts the moment the guest gets out of the car, the moment they walk into the event. So that's when the experience starts. So we just take the, the creative they have, we use that as inspiration, and we try to, and we turn that into an experience for the guest and a television show so that it's so that there's continuity from start to finish. And we do that at a pretty high level. So that's where we come into play, because we understand the television side as much as we do the special events side. And that's kind of how I built my business, is that a lot of these pre-shows, mm -hmm. TV Guide, E! Extra, that do these red carpet shows that have a performance on them, these event companies may know events and flowers and linens and florals, but they don't understand the logistics of television right. or the engineering behind television or what it takes. That's where I built my business, is we understand that side as well as we do the special events. So we've built that into quite a successful little thing we got going. How long does it take to bring together an event like that? Once they well, say, Joe, you're on board. We are talking about CNN. We started talking about CNN Heroes two months ago. Okay. We have not. We are submitting drawings next week, the first drawings of the, the layout. Now, depending on if it's in the same location, if it's in the same location, you can take the playbook out from last year. You can go over your postmortem notes, this worked, this worked, this didn't and you can build the show from there. When you go into a new venue, it's, you're starting all over. You know the show, you know the players, but you start all over. Perfect example, BET Awards. Mm -hmm. BET Awards is the Academy Awards for black entertainment television. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous undertaking. We did it at the Shrine the last couple of years. We're now moving this to a three-day festival at the Nokia Stash Slaples Live uh, area. We're starting from scratch. So it takes... We're already starting on BET Awards for next year. That's in June. Wow. I think most people would be surprised that that much planning goes into it. There is, and, and it's not just me. Right. I mean, there we employ 60 or 70 people on what we do right. outside. The main show is employing three, four, 500 people. The wow. planning is enormous. I mean, because it's not only production. You then have to get in city services. You have to get in, depending on how, how profile it is, Secret Service, Academy Awards. We're dealing with Secret Service, the FBI, DOT, um, LAPD, uh, Los Angeles Fire Department, and we're not dealing with 
with the the guys in the office. We're dealing with the brass, wow. and you can walk around, and there's a sniper there, there's a sniper there, there's a guy there, there's a guy there. It is enormous. We shut down subways. We shut down freeways. It's it's, I mean, it's Jeez. it's a classified. I think the level is orange, classified orange event, which is right up there with the Super Bowl, which mm -hmm. is the highest classification for terrorist activity you can possibly get. So those events are no joke, and there's yeah. background checks, and there's all of these things that go into it, and we take them very seriously. So, yeah. I mean, it looks great on television, yeah. but the work going into them is enormous. I mean, just like you know any other big high-profile event. Interesting. Speaking of that, let's talk a little bit about media. Media has changed so much. What is the, the biggest changes that you've seen since you've been in the entertainment industry? Well, it's social media. That's, that's the biggest change. The pendulum from when I started, because a lot of our business is based on sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Sponsors drive the content. Mm -hmm. Sponsors pay for the pre-show. They pay for the remote productions. They pay for the event. They pay for the after party. They pay for the green room. You get a sponsor on board who's spending money to activate on site. The, it's, it's, there's limitless the possibilities of what you can do. Social media has changed that because sponsors used to have only a couple outlets mm -hmm. on television, radio, and print, and uh, out-of-home media, mm -hmm. you know, billboards. Right. Now, social media is a new platform. I'm not sold on it, but it's a new platform. So now they're, what we're seeing is brands are spending their money on more experiential marketing on the ground, we're going to take Procter & Gamble, for example. Mm -hmm. Procter & Gamble has all of these brands. They're going to take, let's just say it's, it's Dove soap. They're going to take this new Dove product, and they're going to activate in 25 cities around the country. Instead of spending that money in 25 newspapers around the country, they're activating in 25 malls around the company, country with brand ambassadors, people who are going out talking about this soap. Here, try this on your skin. Mm -hmm. People want to touch and feel and taste and see these brands. So the pendulum has shifted from traditional media to non-traditional is what we're seeing mm -hmm. because they're spending more and more money on the things that we're doing on the ground, on these activations, sponsoring tours, sponsoring concerts, sponsoring a pre-show. You know, it's we're right now we're talking for CNN Heroes, you know, mm -hmm. who the sponsor is going to be for the, the, the live broadcast, right. you know. So that's, that's how we're seeing media changed is they're spending it in a non-traditional way. Well, there's, the media space is so crowded right now, so I guess it's, it's, it's I guess in, in many ways, hard to know where to go. I mean, it's so fractionalized. It, it is. I mean, you look today, Newsweek. Mm -hmm. Newsweek is no longer doing print. They're now going to be online only. It is so fractionalized, and where do you spend your money? I have a very hard time. You know, I'm a kind of a bricks-and-mortar guy. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you start... With the plans for a house, when it's done, the house is built, you can go, God, that's what we accomplished. Right. Social media, we spend a lot of money on social media right. for my for Bonfire Jam, right. for some of our other projects that networks spend. I have a very hard time measuring where that dollar's going. You can look online, okay, we got 25 new Facebook friends. Right. Okay, we've got, you know, uh, 30 new followers. You can measure that, but... What is that money really doing for you? Is it reaching your target audience? I don't know. Yeah. I know I have to spend the money, but I'm going to tell you, when I write that check, I'm like, ugh. And every, I was just with my guys in Nashville last week. He goes, Joe, how are things going? I say, things are going great, but that check I write you every month pains me right. because I don't know how to measure it. I don't know how to quantify it yet. There's not a metric on it. Right. If someone knows it, let me know because I don't know what it is. Yeah, because if you're on Facebook and you click just because you like something doesn't necessarily mean you're going to buy it. or That's right. And you know what? You can buy likes. There's companies out there that buy these likes, mm -hmm. that run their likes up to 10, 12,000. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I know, we didn't buy our likes, so I know what we have. So I don't, I don't know yet. I, don't, I, don't, uh, I know we have to be in, the, be in that realm, in, in, that, space, in right? that space, but I don't, I'm not sold on it yet, although I'm still writing the check. <laughs> and I'm still writing the check. I'm just not sold on it because we have to be. Yeah. You think it's a possibility it's a fad, the Facebook type stuff? I don't know. I mean, you look at, look at what's out there. Look at Pinterest that's just mm -hmm. popped up. Everyone's saying you got to go to Pinterest now. Mm -hmm. You know, people smarter than me 
are backing out of spending money on Facebook. But Chrysler, I think it was just Chrysler that backed out. They pulled all their money away. Those guys are a lot smaller, smarter than me, and they have a lot more resources than I do. So because they're doing it, do I need to do it? I don't know. I think it reaches a specific audience. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's a fad. I just think they have to find a way to monetize that. Mm -hmm. And when they find a way to monetize it, and then guys like me who are spending money on it can find a way to monetize it, then I think it'll make a lot of sense. Um, I don't know that it's a fad. It's mm -hmm. been around, and it, it's only growing once they get into China and they get into some of these places. I think you're going to see that, that space explode. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I hope it's not a fad because I don't foresee people going back to print. Right, you know, right. No one wants to hear that, but right. you look, look at all the news and what they're doing now. Right. Papers are smaller. You, right. Sunday paper used to be that thick. Mm -hmm. That dog on Sunday paper these days is this thick. Mm -hmm. you know, but what do I know? We still spend money in print. We spend as much money in print as we do in, uh, in the uh, electronic space because we have to, mm -hmm. you know, and on radio and on TV. So let me just stay on social media for a second. Twitter. What's, you know, there's a lot of buzz about that. What your thoughts on that? You know, I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have a Twitter account. Our company does and our projects do. I don't know a lot about it. You know, I don't, I can barely keep up with where I'm going tomorrow, yeah. let alone let somebody else know that, Hey, I just came out of the, the Tom thumb, yeah, yeah. you know, and I just saw <laughs> Snooky, yeah. you know, I, 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 you know, I can barely keep up with myself, let alone Twitter. So a lot of people do it. Yeah. You know, I've read yesterday in the paper, Eminem, more Twitter followers than anyone else in the world at 60 million. Maybe he was just surpassed by Lady Gaga. I don't know. I was reading. I was like, Jesus, who has time for that? <laughs> Plus, you know what? Big Brother. Watching out. Over Big it. Brother is watching anyway. I don't want to give him another reason. Yeah. You know, um, not that I have anything to hide, but I just don't have time for that stuff. Uh, uh. So, it's right. it's kind of interesting. Talk to me a little bit about you, you mentioned Eminem and the Lady Gaga's and people like the out of the world. What, what are your thoughts on those types of folks? You know, there's a place for everybody. There's a place for everybody. If if their success is because people are paying attention, mm -hmm. as long as there's people paying attention to them, they're going to be successful. And, you know, good press is all, uh, all press is good press. Some of those people believe in that. You know, I think there's a place for everyone. You know, you can't dictate who people are, what they do, how they entertain. There's all sorts of entertainment. Right. And as long as people are paying attention and buying, then, you know what, those people are going to be out there. Um, they're great entertainers. Listen, Eminem, I have some of his music. He is a, he is a prolific writer of music. He is, his lyrics, if you listen to them, are fantastic. But in the same breath as I have um, Eminem, I've got Placido Domingo. You know, I've got I've a big lot of country music, a lot of that stuff. So I like it all. Lady Gaga, great writer, but she's also an entertainer. I mean, you look at these shows, the American Idols, yeah. the voices. Yeah. You know, you may very well be the best singer and entertainer out there, but if you are the not the best entertainer, Right. And you don't have showmanship and you don't have personality and you don't have something to offer, good or bad, you're not going to be that person that's on that stage at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. not going to happen because yeah. no one's going to pay attention. Yeah. You know, you're you right. have to you have to set yourself apart somehow. I mean, look at that that young Chung guy that was on uh, on American Idol that sold three million copies of that crazy little song, the Asian guy that was on there, mm -hmm. you know? That's what that's what society's looking for. They're looking for a story. Yeah. They're looking for something to to grab a hold of, you know, and go, oh God, did you see that? I mean, and people are spending money on it. I mean, you look at these guys who finish second, third, and fourth on some of these shows. Yeah. If they're smart, they take that captive audience and they go start their own little tour and they do something with it and they and they capitalize on that, you know. When you've got an audience, it's there's something there. In, in, a, in, a, in a minute or so, what are your thoughts on the, the reality shows like the Jersey Shore and things like that? Have we gone too far? I think so. I think so, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Yeah. As long as people are paying yeah. and watching, they're going to continue doing. Yeah. You know, look at, the, look at these networks that are doing. Everyone's in the game now, from mm. National Geographic right. to MTV to, C to networks to CBS. Everybody's in the game. Because I think people are inherently just fascinated with other people. I love to people watch. Yeah. I can go sit, if I'm in an airport, I will sit there when I'm working, and I like nothing more than peace of mind for me 
and watch people. People are fascinated with other people. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those guys. Do I watch um, that reality stuff? No. I could care less. I know a lot of the players in that business, but I don't care to watch it. You know, I, there's other things that fascinate me. Right. It's not people making idiots of themselves. I grew up in Milton. So <laughs> I, it was one big reality show in Milton. Oh, no. So, you know, it was one. So I'm used to all of that stuff. So it's certainly not offending anybody no, in Milton not at all. because you're talking about listen, your friends. And, I, I am, yeah. Listen, I am a very proud Miltonian. Miltonian. <laughs> I go back. I sponsor a scholarship at Mount Milton High School I have for eight years. Yeah. I brought Bonfire Jam back there. I spend money with all the local charities. I am very proud to be from there. But you have to, you have to, you know, there's a light side to everything. Sure. And I try to see the light side in everything, and that's kind of what's gotten me through. And you know what? I can make fun of myself, and I can, you know, I, I'm okay with it. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. okay with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Tell me about the charity you're involved with, though, you started. Big Dreams. Um, about eight years ago, seven, six, seven years ago, I wanted to give back to Milton High School, uh, some, a place that did so much for me. And really, they tolerated me is what they did. Um, I wanted to give back, you know, and I wanted to give back to the kids who were a lot like myself, kids with unique potential. And that's what our scholarship's about. It's kids with unique potential. We go in, my best friend and I, uh, Mike Kreitzinger, we, I called him. I said, hey, this is what I want to do. Are you willing to do it? Well, how are we going to do it? I said, well, you're going to give me X amount of money, and I'm going to throw in X amount of money, and we're going to start this scholarship. So that's what we did. So we put together an application. We ask a bunch of questions, and it's we are trying to find kids who are individuals mm -hmm. and who are unique in their own way. They're not the straight-A kids. They're the kids who are probably working through high school, plan to work through college, who are attentive, who have the grades but not the best grades, but who want to move on mm -hmm. and who have a goal in sight. So we get these applications, and we narrow them down. We narrow them down to the top ten. We go through those top ten, and the ones that he and I match, we say, okay, these are the winners. We call the school and talk to some of our uh, people who are on our board, the teachers. What do you think about these kids? And they say, good, 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 and they get the scholarship. That's awesome. The web address for that is? Uh, www.big-dreams.org. Sounds great. Best of luck to you. Continue Thanks, success. Bud. Joe Lewis. Thanks. Thanks. Enjoyed it. By the way, you can see some more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.